Welcome back everybody to AQA A-Level History. We are continuing talking about the development of imperialism uh, for the British Empire topic um, between around 1857 to 1890. And we're going to focus in on this lesson on this idea known as the scramble for Africa. It is still part of the first and sort of second part of the AQA specification talking about colonial policy, talking about international relations, colonial policy and the scramble for Africa, and this idea of the informal empire. We'll be talking about fundamentally a few different things in this in this lesson. We'll be talking about how the British Empire related to a variety of other empires, the, the sort of international relations aspects of the British Empire. And as noted as well, we will talk about the concept of the scramble for Africa, this being a sort of imperial competition that, that takes place among a variety of, of, of imperial states and, and colonial projects in and around this period of time. So beginning first then, by the sort of late 1800s, we're sort of thinking about 1860, 1870, 1818, 1890, um, there's an increasing concern from the empire about its position on the international stage. Remember, it wasn't just competing um, for territory with the indigenous peoples of the areas that it colonized, but the empire was also competing for territory in terms of its relationship with other empires, namely other European empires. And this was becoming an increasing concern among the British Empire itself. One such example of the ways in which colonialism and the ways in which the imperialism of the British Empire uh, was impacted by events taking place in Europe was the 1871 unification of Germany. Germany becomes unified in 1871 into a single state and then begins to develop to become a new powerhouse in Europe. It becomes a major economic player when it comes to European politics and European international relations it also becomes a, a force for, for, for imperialism on the world stage. The same can be said of France, of course, that had been that had been continuing to exist in, in terms of its imperial ambitions for the majority of the 1800s since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which I guess you could argue had their own imperialism uh, involved there as well. And so too with the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire sort of began to take shape following the death of Peter the Great, Peter the I, in, 18, sorry, in 1725. And it is uh, from there that we start to see the development of, the, of Russian imperialism across the world. We start to see the entrenchment of Russian imperialist ideas with people like Catherine the Great, and then you end up with individuals like Alexander I, who, who fought against Napoleon. You have individuals such as Alexander II, Alexander III, um, Nicholas I, Nicholas II as well, all towards the end of the 1800s and going into the early 1900s. So... In terms of France and Russia specifically, France begins to expand its empire and its territory into Asia. In fact, some of the areas in which France um, holds on to the empire for their empire for as long as possible is obviously in, in the sort of Indochina regions in, in sort of Southeast Asia, in places like Vietnam, for example. And uh, in 1884, Russia takes its empire to the borders of Afghanistan formally um, annexing a lot of territories in, in places like Uzbekistan, in places like Armenia, Azerbaijan, all of these different areas as well, that eventually pushes the borders all the way down to the Middle East, into, into Afghanistan. Another concern in the 1880s were naval programs and the development and growth of various different naval capacities of these different imperial states. Germany, of course, was beginning to develop its navy, but mainly as well, Russia, the Russian Empire and the French Empire also had naval um, naval uh, developments and, and naval ambitions fundamentally. Now, we know already that the, the sort of the, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, if it wasn't also um, India, it would also be considered to, to, to include the, the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was a major player and a major force in terms of the international community uh, all the way up until the end of the Second World War when, when the United States sort of takes over as a major naval player as it develops into a superpower and we sort of get the modern 
conceptualization of the of the hegemonic superpower of states like the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, which is a sort of a separate issue. And it sort of marks a break at the end of the Second World War away from this idea of colonialism towards decolonization and towards hegemony in a different kind of in a different kind of way. So we see a lot of ex imperial expansion during this process. The British response to French activity in Indochina, for example, was to respond by taking territory in Malaya. In addition to this, um, this was done in the year 1874, by the way. In addition to this, um, the British expanded their bases in Singapore. They established a base in Singapore in 1819. So early on in the 1800s, prior to our um, prior to our uh, studies here, but it it illustrates the point of 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 how this expansion begins to take place. The British Empire also would expand into uh, uh, Sarawak, which is in North Borneo, an island in in the sort of in the Pacific. This was in 1881. They would expand into Brunei in 1885, into Upper Burma at the same year in 1885 as well. And so we can see that this is examples of how the British Empire begins to expand in response to and in reaction to the imperial ambitions of Germany, France and, and, and Russia um, in places like Indochina and in places like Southeast Asia. Another major event that we start to see that is also tied into this idea of imperialism and international relations is this idea known as the scramble for africa the resort of international developments led to the establishment of two major conferences and these were two major conferences that were held by europeans in order to facilitate the europeans access to and, o and control over african territory so, of course, as you would probably imagine, African states were not invited to these conferences. This was a conference by Europeans for Europeans in order to be able to take control over and colonize African territory. You have the Brussels Conference of 1876 and you have the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. Um, these are two major conferences which essentially allows for the international community in Europe to divvy up and to and to divide up African territory to ensure that no one is uh, essentially stepping on each other's toes and so that the, that Europe can divide its territory um, accurately without causing conflict in Europe itself. This period of time, sort of the late 1800s, the 1876 Brussels Conference and the Berlin Conference, um, is regarded to be considered the beginnings of the, quote, scramble for Africa. The scramble for Africa um, representing this period of time in which European empires spend a lot of energy um, trying to take as much African territory as possible. And as we start to see this, uh, in this lesson and as we go into the next topic in the next chapter we start to see more uh, African expansion and, 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 and expansion of the British Empire specifically you see how this actually was able to hemorrhage African territories and African colonies Beginning first then with the 1876 conference in Brussels, the King of Belgium, King Leopold, hosted the conference for the leaders from geographical um, societies across Europe. The main motivation of this, uh, of this conference was for Belgium to protect its own interests. Belgium had quite extensive uh, colonial ambitions and colonial interests in the Congo, um, some, uh, a, a fact of history that is um, incredibly controversial and it is an incredibly tough period of history for, for people in the Congo, even to this day, and the, and the effect and the impact and, and the atrocities that were committed by King Leopold in Belgium, um, of Belgium in that particular area of the world. With the Brussels conference itself, of course, Belgium is acting in their own interests to try and secure territory in this area. It also came to a number of conclusions. It concluded, firstly, that Africans were incapable of developing the natural resources um, that they lived in and under um, specifically. And it was actually therefore up to Europeans to intervene um, uh, in order to be able to properly extract and to properly utilize uh, these resources. Now, the interesting thing here is that the framing of this particular point 
is framed framed as a firstly quite paternalistic quite patronizing idea about about uh, african uh, peoples suggesting that well they're incapable so let us go in and help and intervene but in reality while being simultaneously patronizing it is also something that um, was still the european countries acting in their own best interest they weren't going to develop natural resources for those african countries to then be able to utilize and profit from they were going to they, they were going to extract and develop those natural resources so those empires could profit from them as well uh, so of course um, this is really the, the the crux of imperialism right here the second conclusion that it came to in the Brussels conference was that the routes uh, to Africa's lakes um, needed to be developed by building roads and railways. So there had to be a better infrastructure plan across the continent of Africa for the development of and the access to the various different lakes and rivers um, that existed in, in some of the more central areas of Africa, things like Lake Victoria, for example. A third uh, conclusion that was came to from the from the Brussels conference was the idea that an international African association should be established. And this really then takes us from the, the Brussels conference in, in 1876 to 1884, a few years later, uh, and the Berlin conference. Now, the Berlin conference um, was the point at which we see a very clear increase in competition in Africa. So even though the scramble for Africa had already begun at this point, it, the Berlin Conference marked a very key uh, sea change in terms of the extensive uh, impact of and the extensive increase of uh, of of competition in terms of col colonizing African uh, in terms of colonizing African territories. So, of course, the idea of the scramble for Africa wasn't a single point at which they was agreed upon that there would be a scramble for Africa. It is a phenomenon that has been used by historians to explain this period of time in which European, uh, which European, com uh, European states, European empires decided to take over all of these territories. The German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck was the individual who had initiated the Berlin Conference. It was attended by representatives from 14 states, the USA, France, Germany, Great Britain and Portugal um, being, um, being some of the major players of the Berlin Conference. The conference began with the underlying assumption that the basins and mouths of the Congo and the, uh, and the Niger rivers uh, should remain neutral and open to trade. So essentially these were very key and very clear parts of um, of African of the African continent that would remain neutral in order for there to be competition among the empires themselves. The conference was concluded with the signing of what is known as the General Act, a General Act which was incorporated uh, and incorporated in a number of conclusions. Firstly, all nations should be permitted to trade in the basin of the Congo as well as its outlets. Secondly, there should be free trade in all of these regions. Thirdly, the powers with influence in the area should help to protect indigenous people and to suppress the slave trade. This is very interesting. Obviously, the uh, the the Atlantic slave trade was over at this point. Um, Great Britain had outlawed slavery many years before. In fact, uh, at this point, we 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 have sort of gone past even the the American Civil War, uh, the, which has obviously also then outlawed slavery uh, outlawed slavery too, or, or at least. We're not far outside of the American Civil War. In fact, the American Civil War was actually quite late in the 1800s, but it, it, it was at least um, uh, it was at least at this point that we we don't have slavery. Basically, we don't have African slavery, uh, or, or at least we don't have a slave trade that is being perpetuated and upheld by um, countries like Great Britain, for example. A fourth point is that the powers ought to support and to protect religious, scientific and charitable undertakings in and around the empire. And you might think that these latter two, um, these latter two points were at least noble in terms of their in terms of their motivations. Of course, even though um, even though imperialism and colonialism and these empires are 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 not moral okay they a lot of people would consider these to be evil endeavors evil institutions and, and horrific examples of of control over territories and extraction of resources and racism fundamentally it is still nevertheless a noble goal to try and suppress the slave trade um but it still all was underlined by 
this idea of these sort of indigenous, uh, non-white people who lived in Africa and who lived in Asia and at the time previously had lived in, in the Americas, that they were unable fundamentally to, to, to understand proper government, they were unable to understand proper ruling and proper understandings of, of, of what it meant to uh, what it meant to essentially um, uh, to, to essentially live and, and operate and run a state and it was up to the white Europeans to go in and teach all these things for them and show them exactly how to do it which is of course a very patronizing paternalistic and racist understanding of of imperialism uh, and so uh, even though these these latter two um, these latter two points the idea that protecting indigenous populations suppressing the slave trade were still noble undertakings they were still underlined by this uh, general thought process of, of this general thought process sorry of imperialism and this general thought process of colonialism The Berlin Conference essentially established the principle of effective occupation. Effective occupation was this principle or this idea where a European power was able to assert a claim to a piece of land if it had, quote, effectively occupied that area and notified other powers. And by notifying other powers, it meant notifying other European powers, of course. Now, the Berlin Conference initiated and perpetuated this idea of the scramble for Africa. In fact, by 19 1900, so only 20 or so years, or less than 20 years, after the Berlin Conference, around 90% of the continent of Africa had and was in control of, or by, sorry, controlling of, uh, uh, or uh, by, uh, in the hands of uh, around 90% um, of it was in the hands of Europeans, fundamentally. Um, so Europeans had control of over 90% of the continent of Africa by, 18, by 1900. Ultimately, this means that Africa was seen by historians as an area of peaceful competition among, among European powers. As mentioned, of course, no African representation was present at the Berlin Conference owing to this idea and to the thought process and to, to the general psyche of imperialism um, that, that it was the, the place for European powers to compete over African territory rather than any African individuals or African leaders or representatives to have a say in um, their own self-determination.